Hello my lovely friends, my name is Ava and today we're going to be talking about all of the books that I read in the later half of May. So I ended up reading 14 books from May 15th to the 31st um, and if you want to know what books I read before that point in May be sure to go check out my May mid-month wrap-up that will be linked down below if you have not watched it yet but yeah these are the 15 books that I read after the other books I read in May. I read some phenomenal books this month like I cannot get over how amazing so many of these books are like I feel like almost every single one of them almost every single one of them were four stars or higher. And I found like favorites of the year. I read some amazing buddy reads. I buddy read a lot of these books with people. So I am very excited to talk about these books today. So the next book that I read after my mid month wrap up is Pestilence by Laura Thalassa. This was a buddy read with my friend Kate over at the Book of Kate. I'll link her down below. But we've been really wanting to read this book for a while and I'm so glad we did. We had an amazing time reading this book. She's already continued on with the series <laughs> and I'm jealous because I want to too. Like I really enjoyed this book um, and she's liking the other books in this series. Thank goodness. So I trust her and her opinion. If you want to read like an enemies and an enemies to lovers romance look no further like I feel like this is the epitome of an enemies to lovers romance to me like they full on at the beginning of this book are trying to kill each other and and they somehow fall in love like like what even <laughs> so this is a post-apocalyptic romance if you don't know what that means that's basically a romance that takes place after the apocalypse or during the apocalypse in this happenstance. Um, so Pestilence in here is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse and his main goal in life is to spread disease around the world. This is his soul's destiny. He has no other goal in life, no other mission. He has been sent to earth to spread a plague. What he does not expect is for a tiny human woman to try and kill him. What this woman does not know though is that Pestilence cannot die. Like he regenerates like he is not able to die if you blow his head off his head will grow back like <laughs> she doesn't know this though and so she basically kills him tor like tortures him like by lighting him on fire kind of thing and thinks that everything's good like he's dead but he's not he regenerates and decides to seek revenge on this woman that killed him so his second life mission now on top of the plague is to make this woman suffer the way that he did. This couple is an absolute roller coaster. Again, you start out with these two absolutely hating each other with every fiber of their being. She hates Pestilence because he's killing everybody because of his plague. And he hates her because she tried to kill him. Like she did kill him, but he came back to life. They are pissed at each other. He ends up kidnapping her and literally torturing her while they're traveling around the world while he's spreading his plague. This book has a very gradual effect of like, tried to kill you, I hate you, fine, we're acquaintances. Okay, I might like you, you're fine as a person. I'm full on in love with you. Like it is a very gradual effect and I felt like Laura Thalassa did it just beautifully. I was on the edge of my seat the entire time I was reading this and I cannot wait to read the other books in the series. Um, I thought this was a great read and I was in the mood for an enemies to lovers romance and this definitely fit the bill for that. There's a lot going on in here with him trying to literally kill the human race and she's falling in love with the man who is murdering humans. Like she has this inner war inside of her head that she's like, I'm falling in love with this person, but how can I? Like, I feel so guilty that I am because he's killing so many people like what is wrong with me so like there's a lot going on in this book there's a lot of memorable quotes in here um but i'm gonna pick one to read to you this one is from pestilence's point of view um it says before i even understood the term i loved you i love your laughter and your body humor i love your compassion and your vivacity your fierceness and your loyalty i meant to make you suffer and look at me now desperate to keep you in this land Mm-hmm. Okay. A uh, trigger warning. There's a lot. This book gets dark. I didn't expect it to be this dark, but it was. Um, you have burning alive, like tro trigger warning. I was about to say trope. Not a trope. Trigger warning. Burning alive. Guns, gunshots, plague, death, torture, animal cruelty, and murder. Tropes. There's a lot. So buckle in there. This book has a lot of good tropes in it. Okay. You have alpha hero, assassin turned lover, 
um, captor captive. There's a caretaking scenes, um, chained together at one point. Uh, it's dark, forbidden. There's great banter. Um, the hero grovels hardcore at some points in this book. Um, Enemies to Lovers, it's on Kindle Unlimited. There are many near-death experiences. Um, never been kissed trope with the hero. We also have an innocent hero because of that, okay? Um, it's post-apocalyptic. You have the revenge trope. It's a road trip romance on a horse, basically, you know, because he's spreading his plague. Um, it's slow burn. They're definitely soulmates. Uh, touch her and die. And uh, you have a villain as our hero, so... Um, I thoroughly enjoyed this. It's a 4.5 out of 5 stars. It just wasn't a full five star book for me, but man, this was such an entertaining read. Next, I'm going to talk about two books as if they're one. So I ended up reading Landon and Shay part one and part two back to back, but I'm only going to really be summarizing part one or just like the story overall, because part one takes place when these two characters are in high school and then part two jumps to later years. Um, and I don't really want to spoil anything, so I'm just going to keep the summary for these two books as vague as possible. I actually buddy read this duet with Rachel over at Rachel Reason Sings. We had an amazing time reading these. We both loved um, Eleanor and Gray. It's over there. No, it's behind me now. I changed up my shelf. <laughs> we both adored Eleanor and Gray. So this duet is about two characters that were in Eleanor and Gray. You don't need to read Eleanor and Gray before you pick this one up, but I recommend it because Eleanor and Gray is just so good. Um, so. This book starts out, part one, starts out with Landon and Shay when they are in high school. They are not really friends at all. They're in the same kind of like friend group, friend circle, but they don't really get along. They don't like the other person for their respective reasons. Then there comes this bet that comes around um, that they're gonna bet each other to see who can make the other person fall in love with them first because um, they don't think they could fall in love with the other person. They're like, try all you want, it's not gonna happen. And let's just say things do not go the way that they expected it to. You, you can kind of assume what happens based off of this bet. <laughs> and then the second book in the duet jumps in time and it becomes a second chance romance, the second book in the duet does. And that's all I really wanna say because I feel like anything in this book could be a spoiler and I want you to go into this duet as blind as possible because it's absolutely beautiful. I knew almost nothing going to this and I loved that. Like it made the reading experience so much better for me. I will say there is a difference in rating for me. I gave part one, so book one in this duet, a five star. Um, just because it flowed a lot nicer for me and I loved seeing these two fall in love with each other because you got to see the full on-page progression from I don't like you at all to lovers, you know? And then part two, I ended up giving 4.5 out of 5 stars. It just didn't flow as nicely as book one, but I still adored this couple's romance and like learning about them. For trigger warnings, this is throughout the whole entire duet. You have discussions of suicide, death of a loved one, discussion of past self-harm, depression and drug use. Uh, for tropes, you have a tortured hero, grumpy sunshine, hate to love, Kindle Unlimited, it's on. It's a second chance romance. And you have an author slash writer character that is the heroine in this book. She is a um, like playwright um, and I loved that part of the book. I thought it was so interesting. But this duet does get very emotional at times, so please be aware of that. Um, there's a lot going on in these two books, but I love Brittany Cherry's writing. I get totally sucked into her books. So this was an amazing duet to read with Rachel and um, just also just an amazing duet in general. When we're talking about other books I've read with Rachel, I ended up reading these two books for the summer of Tessa Dare read along that I host with Rachel B. Samantha and Tiffany, all five of us, um, host the Summer of Tessa Dare read-along. I had a great old time rereading these books. Uh, we are currently rereading, well, I'm currently rereading, some of them are reading for the first time, the Swindle Cove series. Um, so this is book one, A Night to Surrender, and then this is book 1.5, Once Upon a Winter's Eve, so a little novella. And I really enjoyed my reread for these books. The audiobook narrator just makes it absolutely phenomenal. I love them. When I first read this book, I think I've read it twice before this, um, but both times I think I gave this book four stars. Um, my heroine Susanna in here created this town Spindle Cove for other women like her that are more outcasts and not fully accepted by the ton or society so they can vacation at Spindle Cove, otherwise known as Spinster Cove, and just like find solace and do things you love to do. Um, and our hero in here, Bramwell, um, is a war veteran kind of he really wants to go back into the um into like being a soldier uh but he sustained an injury in his leg I think he was shot in the leg and 
Um, he has some chronic pain now because of it. He has a limp. He has been tasked to put together this militia in Spindle Cove when there are not a lot of men there. And the men that they do have are quite a unique bunch. <laughs> so um, this is about Susanna and Bram having this very like banter filled relationship. Ugh. It was so iconic to read again. I loved it even more the second time around. I ended up giving this book five stars the second time around. I thoroughly enjoyed this one. Like I love this book because it sets up the Spindle Cove series so phenomenally well. And just like the town is iconic to me. I adored this. Um, I actually found new tropes the second time around when reading this. So some tropes in here um, are, um, this is a funny romance. <laughs> There's so many times I laughed out loud reading this. Um, there's great banter, the hero falls first. It's a historical romance. You have a kick butt woman. Susanna in here is a kick butt woman. Love first sight for the hero for sure. Like he literally like saves her from being trampled by some sheep, I think, or goats. I don't know. He ends up saving her and they fall over. And the moment that he locks eyes with her, he's like, uh, you're mine. <laughs> uh, you are mine. <laughs> um, then you have the never been kissed trope. The heroine's never been kissed. Um, you have a scarred hero, um, he has a leg injury, and then also scars from the heroine because uh, she was very depressed when leaving her family to go be in society and her extended family thought that something was wrong with her mentally and so they forced some doctors upon her and thought something was wrong with her. So she actually has scars in her arm arms from bloodletting um, because they thought something was wrong with her. So she does have scars as well. That's something that they're able to be vulnerable about with each other are each other's scars and um, what they've gone through. And the heroine here is also a spinster. So there's like the spinster trope in here. Five stars, adored this reread. And then Once Upon a Winter's Eve, um, I think I bumped this up a star. I think I gave this three stars the first time around. It's now a four star read. This is a like second chance romance. I don't want to spoil anything, but it's like hidden identity-esque with Violet, who's a heroine. Um, who's currently residing in Spindle Cove and a mysterious stranger who shows up one day, I think on Christmas Eve. And yeah, that's all I want to say about this one because I don't want to spoil it, but we loved discussing these two books. I will link our live show down below. It was on Rachel's channel. The next book that I ended up reading is When She's Wary, which is Ruby Dixon's most recent release. It's the latest book in the Christopher series. I don't even know what number it is. This is the romance between Juru and Tabitha. So Juru lives next door to Tabitha on the planet Rista 3. Um, well, not technically he doesn't live there. His brother lives there with his human mate. Juru is a Praxian, which is like the cat alien creature species. I don't really know how to describe it. He's been staying with his brother and his brother's new mate at their house or whatever. Um, and he doesn't really want to get into like living with them or like being around them when they're doing certain things, right? And so one day I think there's a certain flower or aphrodisiac flower that his brother's mate puts out in the house and Juru is like very frustrated, right? In a certain area and he ends up across Tabitha at her doorstep kind of like trying to see if she can help him. Um, but little as you know that Tabitha uh, used to be a human slave and she was like tortured, starved, was basically abused by the people who owned her. And she is very wary of the outside world and she is a kick butt woman. She has like a weapon in every single part of her home. She has like booby traps outside of her house um, in case someone shows up. And so she is not very welcoming when Juru like comes and knocks at her door and he's like so, He's in a lot of pain, like, because he can't get his frustration out, you know what I mean? Because of this plant that affects him. And so the meet cute moment in here is absolutely iconic to me. Like, I loved it. After that moment, Juro just decides that he really wants to pursue Tabitha, and he does it very respectfully and slow for her because he knows that she's been through a lot in her life. And so he's just gonna take his time, and whenever Tabitha's ready, he will be there for her. So I thought it was very, very sweet. For tropes in this one, you have alien romance a caretaking scene, the heroine very reluctantly <laughs> takes care of the hero at the beginning of this book. Great banter, grumpy sunshine, where the heroine is the grump. Um, you have a hero falls first. Um, the heroine hates everyone in the world but him. Uh, you have a kick butt woman. There's a meet cute, uh, their neighbors. It's a novella and you have a worshiping hero 
I gave this book four out of five stars. Next, I have If Only You by Chloe Lee's, one of my most anticipated reads for the entire year, and it did not disappoint. I'm actually like not gonna talk about this book all that much because you can go check out my live show that I have down below with Brie. Um, we picked this book for the Chronically Courageous Book Club where we pick books that have chronic illness and or disability and or mental health representation. Um, and we talk about them. We read them together and we talk about them. So that was our April May pick was If Only You. So we talk about the book and what we thought about it in that live show. Both of us gave it five stars and I just adore this one. This is about Ziggy and Sebastian. But if you want to know just like more things about this book and what Brie and I thought about it, be sure to go watch that video. Um, but this is like a fake, fr fake friends? No. Fake friends? Yeah, fake friends to lovers romance. The two of them become friends for like publicity reasons and then they become lovers. I'm gonna stop talking about this book, but I really loved it. And I can't wait to see Chloe in a few weeks and have her sign this book for me. Like it's gonna be wild, like so, so amazing. I have another five star read. <laughs> this is The Butterfly Project by Emma Scott. I'm so sad I don't have my physical copy yet. I ordered it. Um, but it's coming in in like four days <laughs> so I can't hold it for you and I'm upset I want to like show it off um but yeah this is the butterfly project this is about Beckett and Zelda funnily enough I realized while I was reading this Zelda is actually in the full tilt duet by Emma Scott which is one of my favorite duets of all time Zelda works at the same tattoo shop that Theo worked in so I thought that was amazing and I really like how Emma Scott like puts little nods like that in books where you have like one little instance where they're connected to each other. Like in this one, you get to meet Darlene. You get to meet Darlene in here, which is the heroine to Forever Right Now, which is a book that I adore by Emma Scott. And so like you get to really meet Darlene in here and oh, I loved that. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, so Beckett and Zelda, um, they are two lost people that bump into each other one day in New York City. Zelda ended up moving to New York um, because she really wanted to get her graphic novel that she's been working so hard for um, published. And then she bumps into Beckett. And then while she's talking to Beckett and she's out in New York, um, her apartment that she's been renting out in New York, crappiest little apartment, <laughs> um, gets broken into and a lot of her art supplies are stolen. And she is like, this is it. This, like, I have to go back home now. I don't have any more money. I can't live in New York anymore. Like my dream is crushed. But then when she thinks about Beckett again, she thinks that this is kismet because when they were talking for the first time, he was talking about he's a few dollars short on rent. So he's going to have to um, like take some more shifts or maybe sell a few of his, the things that he has at home. I think he has some records that he could sell, but he loves his records. Anyway, she thinks it's total kismet that they met each other. And so she approaches him one day after second time meeting him. And it's like, hey, I know I'm a stranger. I know you don't know me, but I feel like we could really help each other out. I need a place to live. You need some more money. How about I pay you the extra money that you need for rent? And I am your roommate in his very, very small studio apartment. So these two strangers end up becoming roommates in New York City. This is like a shoebox apartment with one bed. So you definitely have that forced proximity that I love, love in a romance book. Out of all of the Emma Scott books that I've read, this one is definitely the less like rip the heart out of your chest kind of book, um, but it's emotional in other aspects. This book was emotionally raw in the most real way. Like these characters felt like real actual people. I adore character driven romances. I prefer, I wanna say character driven romances where the sole focus of the romance is on the couple. I don't care about other plot lines. I don't care about some, I don't know, mystery that might be happening. I don't really care. I want to be focused on the couple and what they're going through and what they're dealing with. And that's the epitome of this book. Zelda and Beckett have such real complicated lives that like I, found myself being like, why aren't these people real? Like, I feel like they should be. I really love both of them individually and as a couple. I felt like they were so real and raw and what they go through. Um, I don't really want to spoil anything. I don't really want to talk about what they go through, but what they both go through is so real. Like, I cannot say that enough, honestly. It was a fabulous romance, a fabulous read. I cannot recommend it enough. 
Um, and I can't wait to have my copy because I love it. I feel like Emma Scott is a craftswoman. Like she knows how to write real people on pay like on pages, on paper, on things that come from trees, like written words. She creates real people, real lives, real stories. And it is a gift. For shorter warnings in this one, because there are a few, um, you have substance, addiction, and a relapse of a side character. Um, you have PTSD, panic attack, remembrance of the kidnapping of a loved one. Um, Zelda's younger sister was kidnapped when she was a child and she finds herself very responsible for that. So she's dealing with the inner demons in her head when it comes to that. Um, you have hospitals as a trigger warning. I know hospitals can be triggering for some people, so please be aware. And there is also a trigger warning for death. Tropes, you have an artistic character, Zelda. She is a great artist. Um, you have a big city romance that takes place in New York. This book is character driven. You have a tortured hero. Uh, forced proximity, there is no third act breakup. I love books that have no third act breakups. Like I don't need that unnecessary drama. So I love that. Um, you have the one bed trope and uh, roommates. And this is definitely a winter read. I gave this book five stars. I absolutely loved it. The next book I'm gonna talk about is unfortunately, I think my least favorite read of the month. Well, at least this part of the month. This is Resist by Ava Harrison. I wanted to like this book. I don't think I fully read all the tropes before going into it. Honestly, I signed up to get an audiobook arc from um, Forever and Always PR, which is run by Tori and Jess. They are uh, promoting um, audiobooks. That's what their PR company is about. And I think next time I just need to be more responsible in the books that I choose. I can't just be clicking. Yes, I want all of them because I'm realizing like, oh, like I need to look into these books before I say yes to requesting them. I bet this is a good read. I know a few of my friends have already read this one and they've given it four stars or higher. This book was fine. It was okay. It just has a lot of tropes that I don't care for. So that's why I'm saying I need to look into the book before I agree to read an arc of it, you know? One of them being like a celebrity trope, which y'all know like those are more miss than hits for me. And neither of them are celebrities. The characters in here, the two main characters, neither, neither of them are celebrities, but it deals with celebrities. They're both um, like, what's it called? Like agents or whatever for celebrities. I just did not care about <laughs> the plot line of this book really. Like I didn't, I was not invested in it. I was more so invested in like the couple. Again, like I wanted to focus on the couple and what they were going through. And there was this so side plot of like, this movie that was being made, the two main characters trying to get their clients to work with each other on this movie. And I just couldn't really care less about that. Like, I don't really care. I don't care about that. So I just like, that was a lot of this book was them dealing with this movie and the ramifications of their actors that they're working with and everything. And like, I just didn't care about that. It's a personal preference of mine. I totally get that. So it's like no fault in the book. It's just, that's why I'm not reading it lower than a three star. It probably would be lower than three stars for me and my personal enjoyment, but the book itself is a good book. Like it has a plot line and it has characters that I did enjoy at certain points, but like the plot itself just didn't fit to my taste. And personally, honestly, I didn't really like the hero. So we'll, sh we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I do think the audiobook narrators were fantastic. Both of the narrators, A plus job, like awesome audiobook. Thank you so much forever and always PR for sending this book my way for Tori and Jess. Um, I definitely am going to be more uh, cautious of the books that I pick up because I don't want to rate books that my friends are promoting like low. Like I don't want to do that. And so I am going to be more cautious about the ones that I do pick up because I don't want to rate them low because that's just a personal preference, like what the setting of this book was, you know? Next is a book that <laughs> I have been wanting to talk about for a while, um, but I can't really talk about it all that much. And I've been reading it for like months. I think I started this book in March. <laughs> it's a fan fiction, actually. This is Good Again by Tatiana522. And I was wanting to read a Hunger Games fan fiction after there was like the Hunger Games Renaissance earlier this year because Hunger Games trilogy was trilogy. Whoa, the four movies were on Netflix and I already own, I already own all four of the movies, but because everyone is talking about it and it was on TikTok, like I was like, oh, I'm in the mood again. So let's pick up Hunger Games again. And after Mockingjay part two, I was like in my feels because ever since I was a kid, when I first read these books, and when the movies were first coming out, I felt like I was 
jilted with the end of Mockingjay Part 2. Mockingjay the book is probably my favorite book, but, but I want, I wanted that chunk of time that takes place after Mockingjay and before the epilogue. Like I want that. I want that chunk of time. And this book filled a lot of that for me. This book takes place after the ramifications of Mockingjay and what happens to Peeta and Katniss and their relationship. So um, I can't really say anything else about that. It's like almost 900 pages on AO3, I'll, if I remember. <laughs> I'll link the um, link to the fanfiction down below so you can go check it out if you want to. Um, and then you can also download it onto your phone or um, your computer or whatever like device that you have, like you can get it sent to the Kindle app. But this deals with a lot. Like it, it gets dark and heavy, but that's what you're going to get with what Katniss and Peeta went through in The Hunger Games. I know this book was written a few years ago, but I was actually, the only thing I was really hoping for is that this fanfic would end closer to the epilogue that we get in Mockingjay, but it didn't really get that far. And so I felt like I was a little jilted with that because I was anticipating that, but that was probably my own fault because I was putting unrealistic expectations. Like I didn't know it was gonna end at that point. And it didn't end at that point. And so like, I felt a little down, but that's my own fault, you know? This fan fiction is definitely made for all the Everlark fans out there. Um, like myself, I am full on Everlark. So um, be sure to pick it up. It is a great read. It deals with Pete and Katniss outside of the games, the war, Pete's hijacking, like everything. It deals with a lot. There's a lot of uh, trigger warnings in here. You have overtures of sexual aggression, depression, thoughts of suicide, assault, references to abuse, past child abuse, and grief of the death of a loved one. But this book overall made my Everlark like heart so happy. <laughs> it took me months to read it because whenever I had a break at work, I'd read some of the fan fiction. I didn't really sit down and finish it all in one piece. I thought this was a fantastic read for my Hunger Game, Peter Katniss, Love and Soul. I have a lot of memorable quotes from this book, but one that I will share with you is from Peter's point of view. <laughs> and then he says, I would, earn every scar again if it brought me back to you. And yeah, I ended up giving this book four stars just because again, I felt like I wanted more out of the ending, but that's my own fault, you know? Um, so yeah, I really enjoyed this fan fiction and I'm glad to say I finally finished it. I then read a novella by Grace Draven. I ended up picking up Sunday's Child. This is a about 130 page novella. You can actually find this one on Kindle Unlimited. I know not all of Grace Draven's books are on Kindle Unlimited. Like, far and few between are so pick this one up if you're interested but this does take place during like Christmas time so if you're one of those people who has to like read a book during Christmas time I totally get that you don't have to pick this book up right now <laughs> maybe put it on your TBR for more of the December time period so this is about Andor and he is actually an elf who has been sentenced to help Saint Nicholas for like the next thousand years because he like did something it's for penance okay he's a little trickster Anyway, um, what he doesn't expect is to fall in love with a single mom on earth, like a few years short of his thousand year sentence being up. This book had wonderful Christmas, holiday, winter vibes. And I just thought overall it was a great little novella, Grace German's writing. No matter, I feel like no matter what she writes, I am obsessed with, with what she writes. Like she could write a grocery list and I would frame it on my wall. Like, I don't care. <laughs> One memorable quote from this book is from Andor, and he is telling our heroine, forever is an ocean. You can live across centuries or in a single hour. It's how you choose to spend the time given. Yes, okay, tropes. Um, it's Christmas. It's actually set in Houston, which I grew up in Houston, and I'm always trying to find books set in Houston because I'm trying, I don't know. I always want to find books set in Houston. Um, it's on Kindle Unlimited. Um, it's a novella, there's a single mom, and it is a winter read. I gave this book four out of five stars. Then I ended up reading Darius by J.R. Ward. This is actually a prequel book to the first book in the Black Tiger Brotherhood universe. I don't recommend starting with this book though, even though it is book number technically 0.5 in the series because it takes place before Dark Lover. I don't recommend reading this book at first because <laughs> you will be like spoiled for things that happen in the later books in the series. So I don't recommend starting out with this. Um, I kind of recommend just reading Jared Ward's books in publication order, honestly. Um, so this is the next book that I have to read because I want to read Lassiter, but I haven't read the other Jared Ward books that she's written, a few of them, like the past like three before Lassiter. So 
Darius was next on the docket for me. If you don't know about the Black Tiger Brotherhood universe, it's about vampires who live amongst humans, but humans don't know that vampires exist. They have their own society. And among the vampire society, you have the Black Tiger Brotherhood who are basically kind of like the vampire warriors that have been tasked to protect the vampire race. In the first book in the series, Dark Lover, you read about Beth and Wrath. Wrath is king of all the vampires. They fall in love because, well, first of all, it starts out with Beth not knowing that she is a vampire. At a certain age, you transition into a vampire. And um, she was given up for adoption when she was baby. And so she never knew who her biological parents were. And little does she know that her biological father has been watching her her entire life. His name is Darius. And he knows that his daughter is going to transition. And so he goes to the king of all the vampires who has the strongest blood and is like, let my daughter feed off of you during her transition. And no matter what, like, I feel like this is the best possibility of her to, of her to survive her vampire transition. So that's how Beth and Wrath meet in book one in this series. And so this is about Darius meeting his woman, Beth's mother, basically and their romance and what led him to what he did and what happened to him in book one in this series. So um, I really enjoyed Darius' story, learning about him, and I ended up giving this book four out of five stars. The next book that I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna try and contain myself as much as possible because I could talk about this book for hours because I believe it's going to be my favorite book of the year. Like I don't see anything topping this book. Um, and this is actually a book that's not out yet. <laughs> This book comes out on July 11th, July 11th, so you got some time to wait. <laughs> um, but this is Out on a Limb by Hannah Bonham Young. I could just cry thinking about this book. This book means a lot to me and um, I'm getting teary-eyed. What the heck? Give me a second. <laughs> so um, I also want to mention though, before I talk about this book, there are 80 ratings on Goodreads every single rating of this book, five stars. Like she has a five star average rating. Out of 80, the 80 people that I've read an arc of this book, all of them have given this book five stars. Like that's showing how absolutely fantastic this book is. Hannah Bonham Young is becoming one of my favorite people, <laughs> favorite authors of all time. She is so real in the way that she writes, especially her characters. And the first book that I read by her was Next of Kin which really fed my soul, um, really fed my soul. That one's about, um, one of the characters is a heroine who is about my age and she gets custody of her infant baby sister. And she ends up realizing she's like, she's becoming a mom. Like she has to become a mom like right then and there. And it was a beautiful read. Anyway, so I was very captivated by Hannah Bottom Young's writing style from that point on, right from the get go. This one is about Bo and Wynn. I've been looking forward to this book because it has disability representation with both of our characters. And our heroine in here um, is Own Voices rep for a uh, limb difference. Hannah Bottom Young also has a limb difference like Wynn does in here. And I've been looking forward to this book for months because of the quotes and, and the, and just like everything that Hannah Bottom Young has been posting about this book online. I've just been dying to read it and this book did not disappoint. I personally am not really a person to read arcs like right when they're given to me, I'm just not. I am not, I'm a procrastinator when it comes to stuff like that. But right when this book was put on my Kindle, I dropped absolutely everything to read it, okay? Let me get into the summary. <laughs> so I can't really talk about this book all that much because it doesn't come out for a month. So please be aware of that. But this is about Wynn and Bo, like I said, and they end up meeting at a Halloween party, at a mutual friend's Halloween party, and they, like sparks fly between the two of them. It's definitely a moment where they meet someone that they're completely connected to and they can't help but have an amazing night together. Like they have an awesome hot night together, okay? What they don't expect is for Wynn to become pregnant from this night. Then starts the forced proximity, friends to lovers romance, even though they've already been together technically, but this very much reads like a friends to lovers with pining in there because Bo really wants to try the co-parent thing as much as possible. He wants to be there for Wynn and be there for his baby. And so he offers his place to Wynn. And it's like, how about you move in with me while you're pregnant and the first maybe couple of years of of our baby being in the world. Um, and then we'll figure out this co-parenting situation because when very upfront says, I don't feel like we should be together physically. Like we need to be friends. We need to be parents first and foremost. And I don't want our relationship to complicate things. So I feel like 
for the sake of our baby and our life and their relationship with the baby, like we need to be friends only. Um, so he's very respectful of that and she's very respectful of that in turn, even though they're both like fallen hardcore in love with each other. Like they are all in. And anyway, like I was saying, they end up moving in together. So this causes like a forced proximity relationship where they're living together and getting to know the other person. Like they even play this game every night where they pull a card out of the deck to like learn more about each other every single night. And oh, uh, like I, I love these two people so much. I felt like this book was written for me. It was not written for me, okay? Anna Bottom Young did not write this book for me, but I felt like in my soul, like this book was written for me and what I've been through in my life and what and what I experience and what I struggle with as someone who is disabled, as someone who has a chronic illness and as someone who has those self-doubt feelings, especially about love, like this book fed my soul and I felt like it was meant for me and for others out there like me who deal with a lot of the same things like this book delves heavily into people who think that they're possibly not good enough for certain things in life because of limitations that they have or things that their body has put them through or things that you cannot help you cannot you like like when was born with a limb difference Bo got cancer and had to have his leg amputated like like their bodies are their bodies. <laughs> and sometimes there are crappy people out there who treat you differently because of your body. And it angers me and frustrates me to no end. And this book fully encapsulates how your life should be regardless of your disability. Again, I could talk about this book for hours, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> um, but this book is totally worth it. I think it's possibly my new favorite book of all time. I wanna say thank you to Hannah Bonham Young if you're watching this. Thank you for writing this book. You have made me very hopeful in a very bleak world sometimes, a world that can be very bleak at times. You've made me very hopeful about the love that I could possibly receive. So I, I love you for that so much and thank you so much for writing this absolutely phenomenal book. Okay, trigger warnings in here. You have pregnancy, ableism, depression, past suicidal thoughts, and cancer in the past. For representation in here, you have a limb difference and the hero is an amputee. There are so many memorable quotes in here, um, but I have to pick just one, the ones that I have listed. Oh, okay, I have to read this one from Wynne's point of view. Then he kisses every single one of my little fingers, one by one. No one has ever done that. I've never bothered to imagine that anyone could touch me there so intimately. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> oh, okay, let's put it together. Okay, tropes, accidental pregnancy. This book takes place in Canada, so that's cool. Um, it's character driven, a character with glasses, Bo has glasses, a cinnamon roll hero, forced proximity, pining, there's a memorable meet cute moment, one night to more, disability representation, and they are roommates. Um, so thank you so much, Hannah Bonham Young, for sending me an early copy of this book. It definitely did not disappoint. And of course, without me even having to say it, this book gets a five out of five star rating for me. Okay, the last book that I have to mention for this video, this video is quite long. <laughs> I've been talking for almost an hour. Um, but yeah, I can't really talk about this book all that much because I don't want to spoil it for anybody. But uh, I read Sea of Ruin. I finally read it. <laughs> I really wanted to read this book before Book Bonanza and I finally got to it and who we who doggy this book did not disappoint it's another five star book another five star book i read this chunky monkey all in one day almost in one sitting like i was obsessed with it i could not put it down it was so intriguing it left me on the edge of my seat and i also want to say like one of the main reasons why i loved this book is because it fed my pirates of the caribbean loving soul like Pirates of the Caribbean, top three movie franchises for me of all time. Like I grew up loving those movies. I still love them. Like they're some of my favorite movies literally of all time. They are works of art. And this book huh, put me in that same mindset that I, I feel when I watch those movies. And I loved that. I loved it. It's like you're reading a book that takes place in the Pirates universe but it's not this book is way darker um but it, it fed that soul it fed my soul for that this is about bennett sharp who is a 
woman who is a pirate and she's being hunted because she's a pirate. Piracy is illegal. But she only really truly fears one man and that's her husband priest. He has been hunting her for some time but uh, things get a little bit hairy when he's trying to find her and hunt her down because she gets kidnapped by a pirate hunter named Ashley. And things get a little bit more complicated <laughs> when uh, Bennett realizes that she may or may not be in love with these two men. I don't really want to say anything else because it could be a spoiler, so I'm going to leave it at that. But this book did not disappoint. Um, definitely one of the most dark books that I've read. Um, but I went in like knowing that there are a bunch of trigger warnings. You have sexual assault on page. So please be aware of that. There are like multiple instances of that. I do want to say too, like I thought there would just be one, but there are like over three, I want to say towards, towards Bennett. So like, please be aware of that. You think, oh, you've read the one essay on page scene. You think maybe that's done. It's not, please. I just want to like warn you, um, suicide. Grief of death of a loved one, kidnapping, torture, death, gore, slavery, dismemberment, and infertility. For tropes, you have alpha heroes, betrayal, capture captive, cheating, dark romance, forced proximity, hate to love, historical, married couple, possessive, and touch her and die. I gave this book five out of five stars. This book did not disappoint. And I wish I could talk about it more, but I just can't because anything I could say could be a spoiler. But like... Mm. I was obsessed, very much obsessed. Anyways, there you have it. I've been talking for literally an hour. So uh, those are all of the books that I read in the later half of May. I had an amazing, amazing later half reading month. Like this month, I read so many favorite books. So um, thank y'all so much for watching this video. Let me know down below if you've read any of these books or if you plan to. And if you don't feel like commenting any of those things, you can leave me any pirate related emoji in the comment section down below. But anyways, thank y'all so, so much for watching. I will see y'all soon in my next one. Bye y'all.